So if everybody is settled down. Um, I think we should um, start with a bang. And the biggest bang that we could think of is to ask Shukandada, Mr. Shukandada Chaudhary, founder director of the school, to speak on, um, and, and he has volunteered uh, to speak on why digital humanities. Thank you. I should make it clear I didn't volunteer to speak. I was coerced into speaking by Omlan. I mean, the subject then might have been my choice. And well, you know about the Big Bang Theory. At the time of the Big Bang, the whole universe was, you know, just a minute fraction of the size of the tip of a pin. So uh, that is, I think, about the extent of my knowledge of the subject. And I'm rather daunted at the presence of specialists in various fields which are not my own. But anyway. My lecture is in English. Taragami just do to kotha Banglai bolchi. Kan achke shotti amar pukhe kubeta anonde din. Karon achke mota muti dosh bochar agi. 2003 shaler August September March nagati. Jokhon hoy thori shopon dukche shopon. Ami amar koi jon amre shokon mi amre jokhon school of cultural text kothon kara kato pratham phabi. Tokhon mane ato dur je ele dosh bochar baad jinish te kirokom dana be ototo chinta karar abokar shaini shahosho hai to borsha hai ni. Kintu এই গোছের একটা কিছু হবে এরকম একটা আশা নিয়ে তো করেছিলাম এখন সেটা যে অন্তত কতগুলি দিক দিয়ে হুম একটা সম্ভব হয়েছে তখন সেই সে অনেক ঝগড়াঝাটি করে সেই আর্টস বিল্ডিংয়ের চারতলায় একটা ঘর পাওয়া গেছিল সেটা কম্পারেটিভ লিটারেচার ডিপার্টমেন্ট আমাদের খুবই বদানোভাবে আমাদের ধার দিয়েছিলেন ঘরটা সেখানে যতজন প্রকল্পকর্মী কাজ করতো সকলে একসঙ্গে বসতে পারত না এ তো দু একজন এখন আমাদের সঙ্গে আছে জানে কম্পারেটিভ না না তার আগে घाटी बक्तृता दिए बक्तृतार व्यवस्था कर जैकलान जो एत बड़ो मिजिक आर्क से तक मैं एक कम्पिटार मैं से भाग कर अन्न क्जे संगे से शुरू हो সামনে তো অনন্ত পথ পড়ে কিন্তু এত দূরও যে আসা গেছে এবং বিশেষ করে দুটো জিনিস হচ্ছে যে আমাদের শেষ পর্যন্ত তো একটা ভদ্রগোছের একটা নিজস্ব ঘাঁটি হতে চলেছে একদিন না একদিন তার ওদের জল ছাত হবে একদিন না একদিন দেয়াল শুক হবে একদিন না একদিন সে ঢুকতে পারবো এই আশায় আমরা আছি আর এই যে এই পাঠ্যক্রমটা শুরু হচ্ছে এটা একটা খুব বড় কাজ এটা সেজন্যে মানে আমাদের প্রতিস্থানীয় যারা তাদের তো ধন্যবাদ দিতে হয় আর সাধুবাদ দিতে হয় অবশ্যই अमलान के मईनाक के तरा एट सम्भव करते पे आगे हमें पर जेटा मन हे जो कथाटा सहपाचार्य सत्यारे इंटरडिसिप्लिनारि स्टाडिज एक जगह जेटा होते कारण ये ठीक है जो जदवपुरे जे तीनटे फैकल्टी आतगुल इंटरडिसिप्लिनारि स्कूल आर क्ज निश्चय इंटरडिसिप्लिनारि क्यों बसिभाग क्षेत्र देखा जाए जो अध्यापक दत्त बोलें जो एक स्कूले एक फैकल्टर सदस्य ही प्राधान्य एवं तर मैं अन् फैकल्टर विषय सम्बन्धे कि जेने खूब भलोक ही जेने खूब भलो क्ज ही करु से क्जटा एक पर्यायर दिखे जो पे ना जमन क्या जो बुझे तो अनेक दो एक प्रवीण सहकर्मी अवश्य एवं जरा नवीन सहकर्मी तर अधिकांश जदिव मैं आर्टस ही डिग्री তারা কম্পিউটার সম্বন্ধে এবং অন্যান্য নানা রকম যন্ত্রপাতির ব্যবহার সম্বন্ধে অনেক কিছু জেনে গেছে তারা আশ্চর্য দক্ষতার সঙ্গে শুধু সেগুলি চালাতে পারে না তা নিয়ে চিন্তা করতে পারে এই গত সপ্তাহে যেটা ইয়ারটেল ইস্টার্ন রিজিওনাল টেস্টিং ল্যাবরেটরি সেখানে আমাদের কতগুলি কম্পিউটারের কতগুলি সফটওয়্যার পরীক্ষা করার জন্য নিয়ে গেছিলাম আমাদের দু একজন তরুণ সহকর্মীর সঙ্গে ছিলেন যাদের পুরোপুরি আর্টস আনুষ্ঠানিক লেখাপড়া কিন্তু তারা সমান্তালেই ওই ওইখানকার খুব দক্ষ কম্পিউটার বিশেষজ্ঞদের সঙ্গে কথা বলে যাচ্ছিলেন তবে একটা পর্যায়ের পরে এসে সত্যি সত্যিকারের মানে ইন্টার ফ্যাকাল্টি একটা আদান প্রদান দরকার হয় সেইটা সরি আমি এটা সেইটা এখন তার পথ আরও বেশি করে খুলে গেল সেটা প্রথম উপভোগ করেছিলাম আমি এই বিচিত্রার কাজটা করার সময় যখন জানা 
অসাধারণ সাহায্য করেছিলেন একজন তো এখানে বসে আছেন আমাদের অধ্যাপক চন্দন মজুমদার এছাড়া আরও কেউ ছিলেন তাদের কাছ থেকে যে সাহায্য আমরা পেয়েছিলাম কিছু প্রবীণ অধ্যাপক কিছু নবীন গবেষক ইঞ্জিনিয়ারিং ফ্যাকাল্টি থেকে যে এবং বিশেষত ওই প্রোগ্রামিংয়ের ব্যাটা টপকানো আর কি এর ফলে ওই বিচিত্রা প্রকল্পটা কেন্দ্র করে সত্যিকারের ইন্টার ডিসিপ্লিনারি আদান প্রদান এবং একযোগে কাজ আমার অভিজ্ঞতার ভিতরে এই প্রথম হলো এখন আর তো চন্দ্রবাবু তো ভরসায় দিয়েছেন এবং আরও আমাদের কিছু সহকর্মী ভরসা দিয়েছেন যে এটা এই কোর্সটা কেন্দ্র করে আরও হবে এবং নিশ্চয়ই আমাদের যে গবেষণা প্রকল্প সেগুলো কেন্দ্র করে হবে এখন আর কালো কি পড়বো না লেট মি স্টার্ট মাই লেকচার উইথ সাম ট্রেপিটেশন ইন ভিউ অফ দ্য লার্ন এড অডিয়েন্স প্রেজেন্ট ইয়ার লার্ন এড ইন ফিল্ডস নট মাই ওন থেনি উইথ ইউনলি মাই ভি ওয়ান এভার লার্নস এনি থিংস বাই ফাই এক্সপোজিং ওয়ান ইগনোরেন্স সো দ্যাট দ্যাট বি প্লিজ দ্য মেইন পারপাস অফ মাই lecture here today we all know or i hope we do what digital humanities means uh, it is the application of digital technology which effectively means computers in practical terms to the study of the humanities but some applications are clearly too simple to deserve the name if i were to write a conventional article on shakespeare or rabindranath then type and print it using microsoft word I can hardly call that an exercise in digital humanities. Digital archiving is a trickier case. Digital copies for access and conservation form a crucial input for digital humanities, but the archiving itself may be thought a preliminary or peripheral activity. Digital archiving confers many benefits. It's like it lets us access material we could not otherwise obtain. It conserves endangered material although with many hazards and problems it even allows refinements of viewing and processing such as enlargement tone or color definition angular or planar adjustment that might in fact make the digital copy a better tool for research than the original in some ways at least but in the last analysis all these benefits arise from the external application of technology the let us access material and look at material more closely that that we might otherwise have been able to do but they do not rewrite the intellectual terms in which we read texts or view paintings or hear music we might as well say that printing a book of poems blends literature with mechanical engineering or that the conservation of paintings integrates chemistry with the visual arts we do not even say that painting blends the visual arts with chemistry though we probably could say so with respect to the pigment and texture of the paint itself or the nature of the surface to which it is applied the value of digital copying for the humanities lies elsewhere not in that it copies but in that it digitizes to the professor mojumdar you know very lucidly explained to us the exact technological implications of digitization is done it much better than i could do and i won't uh, 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 replicate his efforts but just see what it implies to have a digital uh, copy of any cultural material and i should say here that although i will be referring occasionally to visual material or audio material uh, i will chiefly be talking about textual material because that is you know, the the only field in which i myself can claim to have any experience at all but i think that what i'll say about texts should apply mutatis mutandis also to audio and visual material now to say that the value of digital copying is that it is digital is a meaningful tautology a digital image or record renders the original artifact in the radically different terms of a binary code it continues to look or sound like the original but it has been transubstantiated the term from medieval european theology conveys how for the christian faithful the bread and wine of the eucharist though outwardly resembling bread and wine are transformed into the flesh and blood of christ similarly the digitized form of a text painting or musical composition retains its physical entity but this is now the outward manifestation of a sequence of electronic circuits transmitting an intricate code of zeros and ones 
into which the structure of the artifact has been converted. The nearest parallel in the analog world might be the pattern of grooves on a shellac disc or the electrical signals conveying visuals and sounds through a television network, breaking them up at one end and reconstituting them at the other. But all digital records are intrinsically different from their originals in a way no analog record can be. Needless to say, by record, I'm not just talking here about musical records in the popular sense of the term, but any copy. The analog record is a simulation of the original in the same formal or structural terms as far as its different medium allows. Hence, a conventional photograph of a painting on manuscript gives an idea of what the original looks like and nothing more. The grooves on a music disc or the electrical impulses of analog teletransmission only reproduce the pattern of the original sound waves or light waves. All these are ways of reaching the material to people who cannot access the original, but they can be nothing more. They are, in the restrictive sense of the word, surrogates. A copy in the absence of the real thing with no extra value attached. A digital image or record, on the other hand, has been reconstituted as an electronic file. It now takes on a life of its own. I hope I'll be right in saying, um, uh, please correct me if not, that because it has been reduced to these discrete uh, elements, those elements can then be reconstituted in various new combinations, new forms. Thus, a digital image or record can be widely analyzed and modified by devising appropriate software. An OCR program, optical character recognition program, can convert a printed page or the digital image of a printed page into a text file whose characters can be tracked, searched, compared, and even altered. A digital visual image can be transformed by using Photoshop or other advanced software of that kind. Sound editing programs allow similar processing of audio material. One may argue that such results might also be obtained by analog or indeed by crudely physical means. You can paint over the original surface of a painting. You can edit a sound recording by adjusting the settings and beyond that by literal cutting and pasting as you do with films. You can probe the surface of paintings and artifacts with x-rays and infrared photography. But in all these cases, the nature and extent of the change is restricted by the nature and extent of the original material. It is also often irreversible. With a digital file, on the other hand, change is a basic fact of its being. Given suitable software, its components are endlessly variable, repeatable, and reversible. Intrinsic change is the most drastic processing that a digital file can undergo. Less radically, it can be counted, searched, temporarily dismantled or recast for some purpose, or compared with other files. Through these and other functions, computational technology allows us to study our object in ways that could not be achieved otherwise. And it is only when we get to that point that we can truly say that we are practicing digital humanities. So what can these other ways, these new ways, be? This obviously raises the question of what computers can do. The answer involves another tautology, uh, one, in fact, which I'm actually filching, as I'll filch other material of my, this paper, from a remark made by Professor Palash Baron Paul during a seminar organized by the SCTR a couple of years ago. He pointed out that a fact we frequently forget is that computers can compute. They can count and calculate at a speed, across a range, and with a degree of accuracy unthinkable by any other means. Some might say that ultimately that is all they can do, to compute. But the, the results of the computation are endlessly varied. In the humanities as in other fields, by this facility of computing, of counting and calculating to put it very crudely, computers can open up lines of inquiry that even if thought of earlier, even if not conceptually or epistemologically new, could not be pursued in the absence of adequate means. A very simple example is the making of concordances. It's a list of all the words in a particular text 
or the works of a particular author. In the pre-computer age, a concordance, even of a relatively small corpus, was such a laborious and error-prone undertaking that it was only viable for major works and authors, like the Bible or the plays of Shakespeare. Today, given a set of electronic text files of the works in question, a concordance can be compiled swiftly and accurately, or the material traditionally pervade through concordances can pre be presented in new, handier forms through new interfaces for the output of a customized search program. By solving the challenge of quantity, computers necessarily bring about qualitative changes in the agenda of a discipline. Now, to view this logic at its simplest, just consider this. If we could not count beyond 10, most fields of human learning would be literally inconceivable. Now, advance that logic to a in this the advanced degree, um, and you'll, it's easy to see that the computer's powers of number crunching allow new lines of inquiry that can change the whole orientation of a discipline. One such new development is the macro analysis of cultural data. In literary history, for instance, scholars have traditionally focused on a relatively limited range of material. Uh, if not a single book or author, maybe a single genre, theme, or period. Moreover, a canonical fraction of the total output. In fact, one marks a definite tendency as the range of the scope of the study expands if you proceed beyond a single author to a whole genre, beyond a single genre to a whole period. The number of works you actually study decreases in inverse proportion. If you're considering a single author, you can look at all his or her works. If you're looking at an entire period, you have necessarily to be selective in the number of works you can uh, consider in any detail or even mention. This is understandable and even desirable if the study is to be kept within manageable limits. If the data increases concurrently in quantum and complexity, it becomes hard to assimilate through conventional discursive means. The task grows incrementally more complex if we consider context alongside content. If, for instance, we wish to combine literary history and interpretation with book history and the history of reading, to say nothing of biographical, social, and historical issues. If you wish to examine the entire body of relevant material without any canonical exclusion, we are likely to have an unmanageable task on our hands. Yet such is the agenda of Franco Moretti's macro-analytic study of the traffic in texts, his book called Graphs, Maps, Trees, Abstract Models for a Literary Theory. To present his findings and conclusions, Moretti chooses three models. In his own words, I quote, graphs from quantitative history, maps from geography, and trees from evolutionary theory. He comments, I quote again, these three models are indeed abstract, but the consequences, on the other hand, are extremely concrete. Graphs, maps, and trees place the literary field literally in front of our eyes and show us how little we still know about it. At this point in his book, Moretti does not explicitly mention computers, but he is clearly pointing in the direction of computer graphics as practiced at his own center for the study of the novel at Stanford University or in similar centers and projects elsewhere. And here let me show you the first of my projections as uh, I'm sure what I've been saying for the last five minutes must have been ringing loud bells in many of your heads. Those of you who uh, attended Binayak Dashgupta's lecture in the SCTR about this time last year. And in fact, uh, with Binayak's very kind permission, I am, in fact, got these references from him. And I'm showing you, in fact, this, uh, the first two or three slides I'll show you are the ones that he did in his talk. And this uh, is a graphic uh, from the website, uh, The Republic of Letters. Um, actually, it's, I can uh, enlarge it somewhat. Uh, see, what is? Uh, let me go back a little to and show you the first the disconnect. I mean, what this map of Europe purports to show uh, the movement of letters between London the biggest center there, and other centers in 18th century Europe. It is from the Stanford project 
of the Republic of Letters. See? Now, here you're just show, seeing lines in various colors, but different types of material and different degrees of different volumes, as it were, linking up the various centers. But there are other um, ways he's presenting the same material, these dots of various sizes and various colors represent, again, different volumes of material emanating from these centers. And that is the volume map. And this is the flow map, where uh, well, I'll enlarge it as much as I can, which is not as much as I would like to. And you can see more clearly how there are actually you know, sort of lines of light traveling between these centers. Now, I'll come back to this later. Um, now for the other material, I can actually show you stills. Um, this is a still, again, another of my borrowings from Binayak's repertoire, the last of those, the, the ones that will follow up my own discoveries, as it were. This is a page from the, the, the Iraq war logs based on the WikiLeaks. And there again, um, let me enlarge it a little bit so that you can. I don't seem to have much success. Um, No, that won't. Anyway, look, can you at least roughly see those who are sitting at the back? Can you roughly see, you know, what the, the words here? Officer, female, mortar. No, no, that's a different one. Uh, children, I don't, that, there's a problem with the, uh, the keypad. Uh, the city is uh, basically what he's uh, trying to do is sh show various key words that occur in many of the records relating to the Iraq wars to show how many times each of these key words occur and how they are linked. How many times a number of linked words might appear in the same document. And that is presented in the form of this visual. Uh, this is from Jonathan Stray's overview project. This is one of the various databases which you put there. Note the radial structure of the graphic interface. It is a model drawn from graphic presentations in utterly different fields, like chemistry, genetics, and molecular biology. You know, you have these diagrams showing the, you know, the structure of a molecule, the structure of a cell kind of thing. Um, the term phylogenetic tree has been applied to, see, this is, in fact, an article in Nature I think one of the rare articles in nature devoted to a medieval poetical work. See, the v different manuscripts of the Canterbury Tales, uh, the work which I think Professor Thakur mentioned, uh, yes, uh, for whatever reason, Canterbury Tales has attracted a great deal of attention from various kinds of scientists and quasi-scientists, and it was in fact the first um, subject taken up in uh, Peter Robinson's project Collate, uh, which was the most elaborate uh, textual collation program in the world, if I may say it, until our Prabhed came along as part of the Bichitra program. But uh, <clears throat> that is actually a fact, really. But uh, still, uh, Collate and Prabhed, I think, do somewhat different things at roughly the same level of complexity. But anyway, see, <clears throat> this is the what in uh, traditional literary studies, textual studies, called the schematics, the relation between the different, uh, the diagrammatic relationship between the different uh, manuscripts or uh, texts of uh, versions of a work, presented uh, in, uh, again, this uh, a kind of radial design, not a linear structure, uh, but emanating in many directions from a central point, or a, actually a couple of central points, basically. Um, but the, there should be hypothetically one center linking even those two. Um, and let me show you another 
of these. Uh, this is one which is actually to be found in uh, the very little literature that Peter Robinson makes available about his Chaucer project. This is the schematics of uh, one particular tale of the Canterbury. I think it's the wife of Bath's tale. Um, now, just look at this or the couple of uh, diagrams I showed you before this and compare it to the traditional stemma, see, whose concept goes back to the Renaissance, if not earlier, and diagrams along these lines actually came to be uh, devised from at least the 19th or even the late 18th century. The, classically associated with the great German textual scholar Lachmann, Karl Lachmann. Uh, here the pattern is much more linear. But now you're moving from the linear to the radial mode. And in this connection, let's again go back to the Republic of Letters map. Okay. Uh, all these uh, radial uh, structures, they have multiple nodes. There is no single central point of dispersal. In this map, the biggest node is centered on the city of London. But you can vary the perspective to present the entire uh, process from the perspective of one of the other modes, if you so like. So again, this doesn't seem to be happening here, but it can be done. There are ways of doing it. See. So that the data which is being presented in the form of simpler bar graphs in the right-hand column there is being visualized in very different ways in the central map. Okay. In the Iraq war logs, OK, thanks. In the in the Iraq war logs, see, um, the nodes are presented in a visually fluid manner. You can move from node to node through paths of varying widths, depending on the importance of the link, the number of connections between any of these two terms. Okay. Okay. Now, our first response to such an interface is impressionistic. Okay. We just take in a kind of general uh, impression at a glance. The actual quantification behind this cannot immediately be grasped. But there is quantification, and especially with the dynamic display as with the Republic of Letters, uh, to get a sense of the quantification is a full sense is very difficult from a diagram like this. But clearly, if you consider the width of the various lines, there is, some calculations have gone into them. In the Iraq war logs, for example, as uh, its maker uh, said, each report is a dot. Each dot is labeled by the three most characteristic words in that report. So actually, this is quantitative data organized in multiple sets. The stability of numbers is underpinning the tracking of a fluid open-ended process, as cultural processes tend to be. One of the classic features of hypertext is that it allows entry and exit at any point, at any node of the network of links. Jerome McGann, the great guru of uh, digital textual humanities, uh, he and his center at the University of Virginia have contributed uh, probably as much as any other single uh, center anywhere uh, to the development of textual digital humanities, textual computing. Well, Jerome McGann has a classic article, The Rationale of Hypertext. Uh, in a kind of revised version of that, uh, which was included in his book with the punning title, Radiant Textuality. Radiant meaning is bright, shining, but also radiant in the sense of radiating. Okay. Uh, well, in that revised version of his article, McGann ad adds a quota, a coda, and there, this is what he says, a rather long quotation from him. Of course, it is true that every particular hypertext 
at any particular point of time will have established preferred sets of arrangements and orderings, and these could be less or more decentralized. The point is that the hypertext, unlike the book, encourages decentralization of design. Hypertexts provide the means for establishing an indefinite number of centers and for expanding their number as well as altering their relationship. One is encouraged not so much to find as to make order and then to make it again and again as established orderings expose their limits. I mean, in this diagram, you can take any of those nodal words and orient the entire diagram to that. Just as you can draw a map of the world on a globe you know, based on any location. The progress from a linear to a radial visualization, that is to say to a radially structured conceptualization, you visualize things in a particular way because you think of it in that way. Uh, that, that, so this visualization, this conceptualization, it's a, a cultural process, is a fascinating topic that demands a study of its own. I will not pursue it here, only note that it marks a paradigm shift in the precise sense of the term brought into being by the theories and practices I am reviewing in this paper. Now, in the content or purport of these interfaces, there is nothing that has not in abstract terms been thought out by a speculative textual theorist or a historian of culture. But it is the enabling agency of the computer that by furnishing the required data and furnishing it in this way has opened up a new branch of literary history or historical documentation and in a wider perspective, many histories of reading, publication and cultural interaction. Like the initial terms of the exercise, the theoretical conclusions, um, you go back, let us say, to the Republic of Letters, the actual data which is drawn from there, uh, it is free of explicit computational content. What you're trying to work out are relations between certain cultural centers. Your ultimate end is not to work out sums, just to achieve some figures. But in order to reach those wider conclusions, you need the figures. The questions we are asking about the circulation of texts and the intellectual transactions between the readers are basically non-quantitative. So are the final answers. Or more precisely, we may call them trans-quantitative. They do make crucial use of numbers, but subsume them in a wider analysis. Once you've asked how many letters have been, uh, been exchanged, then you get down to the contents of them and progress to other conclusions which are not maybe so obviously quantifiable. Maybe they are at another level, but not so obviously. But you need this quantification at one level. That's why I'm saying the total process is trans-quantitative. The student of the humanities, especially of verbal texts, can go far in defining or even quantifying his material, but he feels continually that the whole exceeds definition and analysis and that this excess is the most, most important factor in the object's being. What is important is not what he can quantify, but what he cannot quantify. This is the way we generally think about humanities, isn't it? So is computation then, in the context of the humanities, merely an instrument, a catalyst that helps to advance the inquiry, but does not form part of the solution? At the most basic epistemological level, is digital process irrelevant to the humanities? We should hesitate before we reply. I have said that the conclusions have no explicit computational content, but they are best expressed and perhaps only expressible through an electronic display, a screen interface. The print medium would have to rely on an inadequate still reproduction of this display, which is all I can offer you here, for instance. Uh, or its equivalent in tables and charts. A verbal account would be exceptionally hard to follow if it could be generated at all. The same situation obtains in a more familiar field of textual scholarship, the collation or comparison of texts. Now, a visual or manual collation, which is all that was possible until late into the 20th century. You actually read through different versions of the work and checked the differences between them with the eye. Okay. 
um, it was a very familiar and very tedious scholarly chore, often adequate for its purpose, because after all, not all works offer a very great range of textual variants. Even works where, uh, you know, which have traditionally been much studied and much hyped for the textual variants actually may not have very much of them. I recently collated Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, a work with a fairly simple textual history, as of course most people in this room will know. None of Shakespeare's works has more than three early versions, two quarters and a folio. That's the most it can have. A Midsummer Night's Dream does have three early versions, but the differences between them are rather minor on the whole. And also, it's a relatively short text. So I applied Probhed, our multi-level uh, collation software device for Bichitra, to A Midsummer Night's Dream. It was like taking a sledgehammer to a knot. Shakespeare has been collated countless times by scholars over three centuries. But an alert scholar could actually start from scratch and do the whole thing on his own in a matter of days. Far more taxing tasks of collation have been carried out manually. An awe-inspiring instance that nobody knows about, uh, for reasons which will come out in my account, is the late Poshuboti Shashmal's monumental collation of certain Tagore novels, a work of almost incredible patience and diligence carried out over many years and unpublished to this day. It only exists in a manuscript, of which we happen to have a photocopy in the School of Cultural Texts and Record, a huge pile of pages. There is no fit pr print medium, a print format, to make for a viable published product in terms of either cost or design. So, Poshupati Shashmal's immense and admirable labor is, has effectively never been utilized. One doesn't like to say it has gone to waste. It can never go to waste. But it has not been utilized. One thinks of such efforts with admiration and humility. But the fact remains that by a, you know, a much more mechanical and routine process, just as one part of our program for Bichitra, Tagore's entire works in Bengali and English were collated in a space of two years. In fact, once the text files were created and the program generated, in three or four months, by two or three trained project staff whose expertise, whose abilities were of the highest, but who were, after all, not Tagore scholars per se. Given the vastness of Tagore's corpus and the extent of his revisions, the task could not have been manually completed by 20 seasoned scholars if they had been available over 20 years. And for most of the time, they would have wrestled with routine manual checking and transcription. Even for Bichitra, the huge body of transcriptions largely had to be prepared by hand, as Bengali lacks adequate OCR programs. But we benefited from the electronic base files of the Rochanabali version of the works, the Vishwabharati Rochanabali, prepared by a customized OCR under an earlier Jadaput project. But the full collation was only possible because the transcriptions could be processed on Prabhed. Digital humanities allows, for the first time in the humanities, a kind of outsourcing of repetitive, quantifying, or other concretely definable tasks to a non-human agency. It's like the kind of use of robots that Professor Mojumda was talking about. See, uh, And that non-human agency, namely the program, can carry these tasks out much more efficiently on a scale and at a speed impossible by human beings. The human effort can then be focused on the tasks which can only be done by human beings and there done much more productively because of the far greater body of material available and its presentation in appropriately pre-processed forms. In question is not only the size, but the complexity of the material. <clears throat> in Tagore's work, for instance, there are intricate and minute correspondences between texts with many elusive manuscript fragments that could only be identified and related to each other by a whole series of search and collation commands, which are sort of fine-tuning the process, as it were. Huge chunks of text have been shifted by Rabindranath, sometimes by an elaborate process of splitting and redistributing between one version and another. Such textual upheavals call for collation 
not only of individual words within a limited compass, but between large sections of text, between whole chapters of a novel or a prose tract, whole acts and scenes of a play, whole cantos of a long poem, and within each such large section, smaller segments, such as paragraphs, single speeches, drama, or verse stanzas. Probhed is unique in offering this three-tiered collation engine. In fact, it can accommodate a fourth tier, that of the line, uh, the, or the prose sentence or the verse line. We omitted it in Bichitra as we felt it to be unnecessary. And if it is unnecessary for such complex material, then it is probably unnecessary for most texts in existence in any language. But it is there to be used if we need it. <clears throat> no adequate means has ever been devised for presenting these multi-level divergences in print, and it is hard to imagine one. The only possibility is a table or matrix. Now, I've, I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, or well, I, I think I'll save time by using the stills which I have here. Um, this is the the matrix, or as you'll find it uh, put in the uh, in the uh, the website itself, the grid view. See where the exact correspondence, I don't know if it's very clear, the digits, uh, the percentage points of correspondence between uh, segments of two texts are being noted on this, this table. Okay. But this is something which is going to daunt even the scholar. How much more informative and user-friendly is the other view? Okay. It's an unexpected way of encountering uh, textual collation, but you know these colorful bands have segments. Each of them is segment. Each uh, version of the text is distinguished by a particular color, and within it there are these segments uh, representing the different chapters. Uh, this is the uh, of the novel Gora, and each segment uh, in color. You see, there's a deep blue, lighter, then you know the varying shades of the same color. Each of these represents a chapter of the novel. Then it leads on by clicking on the bottom row from the ch chapter level to the uh, to, to the paragraph level, the segment level, and then from that it leads on directly to the fine collation, which is the word level. See again, it's not very clear, I'm afraid, but uh, by a four-color code. Differences between every word in the different versions is being shown up. Um, you see, a, a red word here means that there's a variant in some other version of the text, and that variant is shown up down below in this window. Bottom. And also, you can get other kinds of interesting visualizations, um, like this one, for instance. Uh, look at the, this uh, v uh, vertical uh, band on the right, where see each of these little rectangles represents a paragraph in one version, and that paragraph might as might have been split, and its components divided between other paragraphs, redistributed between other paragraphs in another version. You see how complex it gets around here. These are. Uh, these are two texts of, uh, out of the 12 manuscript versions of uh, Rokto Korubi. Uh, Rabindranath uh, you know, was radically reorganizing his text. <coughs> also, in this visual, you can apply you know, pop-up boxes where you can see the, the entire text. As here, see, if you do want to compare manually the results you're obtaining from this diagram, you can do that too. In fact, 
one of my colleagues is working out a much more elaborate version of this display, which maybe over the next few months or within a year at most, uh, it will be possible to present and for us and others to use. Now, now we come to the question. In a, in a case like this, what should we call the result and what the interface? Programmatically, the distinction is clear enough. You first get one and then proceed from it to the other when you're making, when you're creating the, uh, the, the platform. But to the human recipient, the one is integrated with the other. The interface makes visually real the multi-level textual architecture of the work. Moreover, it is not only multi-level, but multi-version. You are looking deeper and deeper into the textual intricacies of each version or edition, and also wider and wider across a range of versions. The collation program opens up an immensely complex and challenging textual universe, what some recent textual theorists have called a docuverse, a documentary universe. When we contemplate the same range of material in manuscript or print with the unaided human faculties, which is a daunting exercise, even for professional textual scholars, we are actually building up a mental picture of the total dimensions of the work across all its versions. As a rule, the more comprehensive it is, the more inchoate. It gets more complicated, actually, more difficult to focus on. Beneath the formal divisions of chapter, scene, or stanza, there is a shifting mass of ill-defined units and relationships, like a planet at the gaseous stage. And think of that um, The, the, that, um, the, the, the data which is actually summarized in that right-hand column. If you try to carry it in your head, it is practically impossible, isn't it? And yet, you have some notion in your head which the computer is focusing and fine-tuning for you. A collation program like software defines and reveals that conceptual structure, probing its neglected corners, penetrating one layer of text to reveal another and yet another beneath it. It is like a geological map of our mental terrain as we explore the textual terrain of the work in its multiple versions. Collation is the staple element in a full-fledged critical edition, a scholarly edition of a work. And scholars are inclining more and more to the view that the electronic site, especially an online site, offers a fitter medium for scholarly editions than print. As I've described, a multiple version text is a dynamic entity which cannot be fixed in print. Separate printouts of all the versions would be too cumbersome to handle or to compare visually. But if they are made into electronic files, you can navigate through them with quick clicks, view any or all of them in any order, or amalgamate them in a single output. You can jump from the image of a manuscript to its plain text, thence to a search engine, thence to a table or a diagram comparing the various versions. A website on these lines constitutes a storehouse of the text processed in all its variants, its secrets yielded up to ready analysis through hyperlinks, multiple windows, and search applications. By its links and juxtapositions, the electronic site enshrines our mental process as we trace our path through the material of a critical edition. That is why Peter Schillingsberg, uh, in his celebrated book From, Go From Gutenberg to Google, uh, designates the ideal electronic edition as a knowledge site rather than simply an information site or a database. Not only because of its comprehensive range of material, but because of the way it is mapping our mental assimilation of that material. As Schillingsberg says, I quote, what is being electronified is an electronic scholarly edition, uh, in an electronic scholarly edition, is not the texts, but the access to texts and textual scholarship. The potential effects are profoundly textual, both in the sense of changing readers' relationships with the text and changing the interpretations and uses of texts. I may be allowed to add a sentence from my own earlier work, my book, Metaphysics of Text. So if I may be permitted to quote from myself, hypertext reflects in material form the free and unique afterlife that each text assumes in the mind of each reader by a unique combination with other texts within that reader's experience. 
and no others, because no two people have ever read exactly the same combination of books. The critical edition consolidates this process of informed reception on a more stable and general plane. It is fundamentally hypertextual in nature, even when, as traditionally, it was presented in print. Hence, an electronic edition with actual hyperlinks most closely integrates the structure of the data with the structure of the output to realize the, the full potential of the critical edition. We clearly cannot say that in such a case, the computational exercise is merely instrumental. The catalyst is no longer a catalyst. It has entered into the compound. The interface is the result. The analytic output is identified with its formal projection in a way we associate more with the synthetic process of the creative arts. And recall uh, Moinak Bishash's remarks earlier that digital humanities is a field where the analytic and the creative functions come to merge. The analytic and the synthetic functions, you see. We commonly say that a poem consists in its unique wording. In the cliched dictum, a poem should not mean but be. A work of visual art, of course, inheres in its precise form, and a musical composition has no existence outside its specific structure of notes. We are less convinced of the precise, unalterable form of discursive reports or analysis. Most critical or analytical verbal exercises aim at a perfection of utterance they cannot achieve. If, by contrast, the interface of a digital humanities program can show a total integ integ integrity of form, it is because it is quantified. Much more evidently than the language of artistic creation, the language of mathematics provides the most important field of integrated formal articulation. A mathematical formulation is precisely itself and nothing else. Digital humanities mathematically computes types of data that we commonly absorb in a more impressionistic way. The mathematics itself is the tool of a still more fundamental algorithmic logic. The idiot status of the computer calls for a painfully precise articulation of every minute step in its operation, as Professor Mojim Das so amusingly pointed out to us. Everything has to be fully and exactly defined, excluding all other possibilities. Thus, digital humanities provides the notoriously intractable material of the humane disciplines with a logical and mathematical underpinning. Students of the humanities face a gigantic task. That's the task in the myth of Sisyphus, where you roll a stone uphill only to have it rolled down again. If our agenda is to pass beyond intuition and effusion, which after all should not be our, the chief tools of our methodology, it must include logical, and often quantitative analysis of material, but material that seems of its very nature to elude logical and quantitative analysis. The elusiveness is owing to two factors. One is the unmanageable volume of material. Every word in a text or every note in a piece of music in an astronomical set of permutations and combinations between any two or more or all of them. But even this range of, th uh, of uh, combinations is, in theory, finite, however vast it may be. What seems truly inexhaustible is the expansive potential of each compound, of each component, its third dimension, so to speak. Again, in itself or in variable combination. The open-ended, semantic, and syntactic reach of words, the conceptually undefined possibilities of visual lines and musical notes. Yet these lines and notes bear a different kind of significance in terms of shape and direction, order and frequency, that is to say, mathematical values. With a sagacity exceeding our own, the European Middle Ages, to whom I return again, as I did on the first page of my paper, the European Middle Ages recognized music as a major division of mathematics. Their notion of a music in the heavenly spheres made by the stars and planets as they revolved was not a simple flight of imagination. It was a metaphor made real for the computable order of the universe. We can try to gauge the situation in visual terms from a celebrated instance of fractal geometry devised by Henger von Koch, the so-called Cox coastline. See, is the kind of design that you get when you take a 
simple than regular shape and you repeat it endlessly. Why isn't this opening? Oh, sorry, it has opened. Ah, here we are. Well, you see, there's a simple triangle. But you're piling up triangle upon triangle upon triangle. Even then, this, what you're getting even now, is a rather a general, uh, a regular shape. This is a more intricate version of the same. Even then, it is so far symmetrical. But if instead of repeating that little cross, in a precisely symmetrical way, you add one to the left and then you add one to the right, you were to make it asymmetrical, then you would end up uh, with a totally arbitrary uh, configuration, see, a totally random figure. But at the basis of that random figure is a very simple and definable shape. Now, you see, I'm not going to talk about fractal geometry, about which I know nothing. But I'm presenting this figure as an image. Let me just say, uh, you know, I mean, we should be very careful here. Well, can I speak for another five or ten minutes? Yeah. Um, this man, uh, Alan Sokol, the man who printed that spoof article full of nonsensical jargon in a uh, celebrated journal of the social sciences and uh, thus uh, played a trick on the whole learned world. He and a colleague had later written a, a whole book on the way students of the humanities misunderstand and misrepresent scientific concepts. I forget what the, the book was originally written in French. I forget what the French title was. It was a more sober title. But the English translation of the book is entitled Fashionable Nonsense. Okay. Now, let this be a warning to all students of the digital humanities. Um, but, and certainly, you know, I don't want to sort of step into this great trap so whenever I feel that, you know, I would like to use what I understand, probably quite wrongly as a, from a scientific concept for my purposes, I say I'm using it as a metaphor. Okay. So let us take this, this cock curve as a metaphor for the predicament of the humane disciplines, seeking for definable elements and designs in an apparently random construct, whose components, however, will yield such elements when analyzed. As I've said, what you're seeing here is a grossly simplified image because it is symmetrical. Only a single recurrent symmetrical shape. No human or humane artifact is so obligingly repetitive and symmetrical. A resourceful young programmer who was telling me about his work on an advanced comparison software that might compare DNA sequences as well as variant texts. Now, DNA sequences is something else about which I know nothing and have no intention to talk about it. But I, I'm sure that to record them computationally is a deeply challenging task. But am I right in thinking that a DNA sequence comprises only four basic elements, endlessly repeated in endlessly variable combinations? But the basic number of elements is only four. So I dare to wonder, maybe in my ignorance, whether comparing DNA sequences can be quite as challenging as the variable number of characters comprising verbal texts in different languages and the endlessly arbitrary patterns into which they are organized at word, sentence, and higher levels. This raises another fundamental issue. Uh, I'm nearly, I'm, I am coming to the end, though it may not sound like it. Uh, when marshalling an indefinitely large body of complex material, we can logically adopt one of two courses. Either we collect a very large body of discrete data and we select the closest match in a given situation. Okay. We can't find something exactly. We gather, say, n numbers. Then we come across the n plus first example. So then we choose which is the example from among those n uh, ones that are disposal, which most closely matches it. Okay. That's one possibility. The other is to abstract a general pattern or principle, or a set of patterns and principles from the data, and then apply it to a new situation. If we can draw a conclusion from n items of data, we hope that that conclusion can also be applied to the n plus first. This tension between the atomistic and the accretive approach on the one hand, 
more and more of individual items, and the generalizing and abstractive approach underlies many paradigms of knowledge. The old nominalist versus realist debate. Are there really categories of things? Are, are this every individual item something separate only, and are a certain number of items only linked together by having a common name? Or um, the relation of observation to law in the natural sciences, ultimately the basic opposition of induction and deduction. The tension takes its own distinct form in the humanities, whose objects of study are especially numerous, undefined, and open-ended, though often reducible to a finite and indeed a very small number of elements, I mean the letters of an alphabet or the notes of a musical scale. Further, the artifacts and phenomena addressed in the humanities are often valued for their uniqueness. We praise a work of art, the more unique it is, the more original it is, the more unlike any other work of art. But it's not just a matter of uh, you know, individual talent or even individuality in the sense of human personality. Uh, to say that every humane artifact, a work of art or any other kind of cultural artifact uh, or cultural phenomenon um, is unique only implies a specific contingency that a general set of sociocultural components have created a particular product at a single unrepeated position of time and space. So in that sense, it is unique. Words and musical notes are part of our general uh, sort of um, resources, fund of resources. But at any given point of time, we combine them in a particular way to create a unique product. And this also holds true of patterns of social behavior, social perception, ethical and intellectual constructs. It holds true of all expressions of the human consciousness, the material of what we call psychology and the social sciences, as well as literary studies, art criticism, or musicology. The humane disciplines operate at the cusp of certain contrary forces shaping the life of the mind, the individual versus the general, the finite and articulated versus the open-ended and inchoate. Digital technology sharpens the lines of this balance of opposites. It maps the specific and quantifiable components with a precision hitherto undreamt of. But let us not forget, it also maps the terra incognita, the unknown uh, terrain, the discrepancies, the anomalies, the irregularities in the design with the same dispassionate precision. By doing so, it authenticates those aberrations and gaps as equally viable entities, potential subjects for investigating, quantifying, and ordering at a remoter level. We may recall Jerome McGann's words, which I quoted earlier. One is encouraged not to find, but to make order, and then to make it again and again, as established orderings expose their limits. Poetry, said John Keats, should surprise by a fine excess and not by singularity. Keats was anticipating the chief raison d'etre of, of the digital humanities. Singularity, a striking distinction or difference, leaps to the eye. We do not need computers to detect it. Fine excess is hard to measure. The finer, the harder. It involves minutely probing and detailing the components of the object, measuring each nuance and divergence, seeking what is special to one particular cast of words or lines or notes among countless others that may look very like it, by its unflagging search for numbers, structures, and variations. Digital analysis reveals more of the closed design of human constructs than could be unearthed by other means. Yet for all but the simplest structures, leaves an elusive residue, which is unmatched and unmapped. And further, it questions the nature of this residue, is it intrinsically unquantifiable, or is it simply too complex for our current computing resources? There can be no final answer to this question because our computing resources are growing by the day. But by asking it so deeply and sustainedly and demanding a concrete answer, digital humanities lends a new edge to the traditional end of all human inquiry. At the same time, it makes new demands of computational technology 
by bringing it to bear on exceptionally challenging material, material of a new order of complexity. And in that respect, digital humanities might have something to contribute. I think it does have something to contribute distinctively to the advance of computer science. And so to sum up, or simply to repeat the thrust of my argument, digital humanities brings analytic tools to bear on material unusually resistant to such tools. One might, regular, one might reasonably argue that such material needs more support, not less, from every possible resource for measured and logical investigation. The computer today affords a ready and superabundant resource, and it clearly behoves us to avail of it. Thank you.